morning, New Gen. We're glad that you could join us virtually this morning. My name is Helena and this is my husband, Josh. Hello, everyone. And we'll be hosting you through this morning's Sunday Scrum. So, to get us started, um, we've got three quick announcements. So firstly, uh, we are hosting a, rule of li a Craft Your Own Rule of Life experience. That's happening this coming Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Now, off the back of Steph's Preach uh, on Sunday, uh, and even a series that we have previously done uh, at NewGen called Rule of Life, this is just such a great opportunity to come and put the trellis in place so that the organic life of God can, can flourish. So I really want to encourage you. It's this coming Tuesday, 7 uh, to no later than half past 8. Um, and all the Zoom details and links would already have been sent out, but we'll keep on making them known. Uh, and it will, there'll be links to that stuff uh, in the description of this video as well. The next thing after that is we continue continuing our Tuesday night rhythms and we are kicking off a six week uh, prayer meeting. And so, yeah, it's just going to be so great to pray to gain, uh, together again. And we were thinking about it probably the last time we did prayer meetings as New Gen was maybe mid last year before the prayer course. So it was a long time ago and it's going to be really good to get back together and pray together and just bring our hearts and requests and our desires and needs before God as a community. So it's going to be a wonderful time starting the 9th of Feb 7 uh, to about quarter to 8. So 45 minutes each time for six weeks. It's going to be awesome. And then the last thing uh, to let you know about is our Valentine's, uh, Valentine's Day coffee drive through uh, it's a coffee drive through that actually just happens to be on Valentine's Day. We're just milking that a little bit. But uh, yeah, bring your family, bring your kids, uh, bring your Valentine. Um, it's going to be a wonderful time before the Sunday Scrum uh, to, come and, to come and enjoy a cup of coffee. And you're going to get to see some people, uh, I'd say face to face, maybe mask to mask. Um, uh, some of our elders and leadership will be there serving you guys coffee. It's going to be such a lucky time at the refinery. So come on uh, from, I think... Uh, 8 o'clock uh, Sunday morning. Yeah, looking forward to it. So I'm sure that we can all recognize and admit and just we don't have to look very far um, from our own families, I'm sure, to realize that the COVID situation is still quite dire. Mm. Um, yeah, there's uh, many families that have been directly affected and um, community groups and life groups um, people falling ill, um, going to the hospital, and um, many passing away, sadly. Um, so we just um, really want you to let us know, to let the leadership team yeah. know, if there's anyone in your community, in your family, in your life group that is unwell, um, let the leadership team know. Mm -hmm. It would be wonderful to have this community of New Gen, this family of New Gen, rallying together um, and trusting God for complete healing and trusting God for, um, for protection and, yeah. um, and just his comfort and peace. Yeah. Um, and we know that the hospitals are still full. Um, the situation there is stressful. The healthcare workers are exhausted. Mm. Um, and so because of that, um, Gareth and Chantal Miles and many other um, new geners have been volunteering their time to pray and to minister to some of the hospital staff. Yeah. So if you'd like to be part of that team, please get in touch with Gareth and Chantal and they can tell you a little bit more about that and how mm. to get involved. Yeah, um, yeah. so I'd love to just pray for us and pray into that situation. So um, let's take a moment now. If you know someone that is unwell, um, join me as we, we pray for them. Mm. Yeah, Father, thank you that we can come together this morning and we... Um, as your sons and your daughters, we approach your throne with such confidence and in humility, Father. Mm. Knowing that you are a good dad, knowing that you are a kind father, we come before you, we bring um, you know, all these people, our friends, our family, our leaders, our um, brothers and sisters, so many people, God, that we know that are currently um, struggling with COVID, mm that have been um, affected. Mm. So many families that, um, that need your, your hedge of protection, that need your um, shield of favor around them. Mm. We pray, God, that you would intervene, that your mighty hand of healing would be over them, God. We pray for wisdom for the doctors and the nurses that are seeing to all these patients, God, that are seeing to all these various situations, God. And we just pray for divine wisdom and insight into each case, Father. Mm. I pray that you would 
have mercy on um, on everyone that is unwell, God. I pray for miraculous healing. Thank you, God, for incredible stories of grace, of, yes. of people um, surviving and making it through and recovering so well, God. We are so grateful that you have heard and that you have answered so many prayers. Mm. Mm. God, I just pray for your your comfort to be with those that have lost. Mm. I pray that your peace would be with mm. those that are grieving and mourning right now. Mm. I pray that your presence would be so close to them. Mm. Yes. That you would make your your love so real and so tangible yeah. to those families, God. I pray for your strength to be with the healthcare workers, with the nurses and the hospital staff and the mm. doctors, God. Mm. Jesus, amen. Amen. Thanks, love. Um, so, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna transition into a time with the kids, and so um, the children's stories have been so life giving, uh, even for me and many other adults I know. Uh, and so, yeah, there's always just such a rich uh, Christ centered gospel theme, and really want to encourage you, whoever you are, uh, whether you have kids with you or not, to just engage with this and allow God to speak to you through uh, the simplicity of a child's story. Mm. So um, after that, we're going to go into a time of worship and we'll see you after that. Enjoy. <laughs> the Singer Wherever Jesus went, lots of people went too. They loved being near him. Old people, young people, all kinds of people came to see Jesus. Sick people, well people, happy people, sad people, huh, and worried people. Lots of them worrying about lots of things. What if we don't have enough food or clothes? Or suppose we run out of money? What if there isn't enough and everything goes wrong and we won't be all right? What then? When Jesus saw all the people, his heart was filled with love for them. They were like a little flock of sheep that didn't have a shepherd to take care of them. So Jesus sat them all down, and he talked to them. The people sat quietly on the grassy mountainside and listened. From where they sat, they could see the blue lake glittering below them and little fishing boats coming in from a night's catch. The spring air was fresh and clear. See those birds over there, Jesus said. Everyone looked. Little sparrows were pecking at seeds along the stony path. Where did they get their food? Hmm? Perhaps they have pantries all stocked up? Cabinets full of food? Everyone laughed. Who's ever seen a bird with a bag of groceries? No, Jesus said. They don't need to worry about that, because God knows what they need, and he feeds them. And what about these wild flowers? Everyone looked. All around them flowers were growing. Anemones, daisies, and pure white lilies. Where do they get their lovely clothes? Do they make them? Or do they go to work every day so they can buy them? Or do they have closets full of clothes? Everyone laughed again. Who's ever seen a flower putting on a dress? No, Jesus said. They don't need to worry about that because God clothes them in royal robes of splendor. Not even a king is that well-dressed. Well, they had never met a king. But as they gazed out over the lake, glittering and sparkling below them, the hillsides dressed in reds, purples and golds, they felt a great burden lift from their hearts. They couldn't imagine anything more beautiful. Little flock, Jesus said, you are more important than birds more important than flowers. The birds and the flowers don't sit and worry about things, and God doesn't want his children to worry either. God loves to look after the birds and the flowers, and he loves to look after you too. Jesus knew that God would always love and watch over the world he had made, everything in it, birds, flowers, trees, animals, everything, and most of all, his children. Even though people had forgotten, the birds and the flowers hadn't forgotten. They still knew their song. It was the song all of God's creation had sung to him from the very beginning. It was the song people's hearts were made to sing. 
God made us. He loves us. He is very pleased with us. It was why Jesus had come into the world to sing them that wonderful song, to sing it not only with his voice, but with his whole life, so that God's children could remember it and join in and sing it too. It's in my soul Oh, your resurrection power Burns like fire in my heart When waters rise I lift my eyes up to your throne No surrender, no retreat We 
chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious.
So I'll shake off these heavy chains And wipe away every stain Cause I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed You said me Awesome. What a wonderful time of worship and uh, just being able to glorify God together and having our eyes and our gaze fixed on Him. So last week, Steph kicked off a series called Annus Mirabilis, uh, which is um, Dutch. No, I'm joking. It's Latin for um, a wonderful year or a marvelous year. And that might seem odd given the year that we had last year and the year that we seem to be having this year. It seems to have started really uh, tough for so many people as well. But uh, if you watched the video testimonies last week, we would see God's hand moving in so many lives through the midst of difficulty and pain. And there were still um, marvels and wonders that came out of last year because of God. And so we're trusting Him for much of the same this year, that this year would be a wonderful and a marvelous year in Christ. Um, despite many trying circumstances, that that wouldn't dictate what type of year we have. But um, in Christ, we could have a wonderful and a marvelous year. And so um, last week, uh, Steph spoke around his custom, which is basically a rule of life. And I really want to encourage us again towards that crafting your own rule of life experience happening on Tuesday. It really is going to be a, a great time. We did it as a New Gen staff, and it was just so um, life-giving and fruitful. And we're excited to share that experience uh, with the broader New Gen. And so we have a couple more testimonies this week, just coming out of 2020, of God's goodness, uh, of God's greatness, of His uh, wonders uh, being worked in 2020. And so we're going to show those in a moment. And after that, uh, we're going to go into this morning's message, which is around knowing yourself. And so really looking forward to it. Maybe I can pray for us as we head into that, and uh, we'll take it from there. So Lord Jesus, uh, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And we ask that you would come and have your way amongst us. Um, you know where every person is at. You know who is watching this, when they're watching it. You know the conditions that we're watching this in, uh, the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and minister to each one of us in our unique setting. We pray that you would draw our eyes closer to you and our, our hearts, that, that they may lean into you as a result of hearing your word this morning. We pray that you'd be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, enjoy. Morning, everybody. Um, Hi, this is <laughs> Hello, Eugene. Yeah, this is a um, just a reminder of the grace of God in this you know this last year or so with COVID, how hard it's been, and um, there's been some highlights. There is hope that God is still good mm. for us. He's still for us. He's still planning. He's still organizing things, um, especially for His people, His church, His body. Um, yeah, and we got a little story of, of a wonderful story about my daughter and um, uh, marrying Michael, meeting Michael, marrying him. Yeah, Jen? Yeah, Michael and Rebecca, um, as a lot of you know, met last year, the year before, and they managed to get engaged during COVID, Very which quickly. was such an exciting time for them. And then it was planning the wedding for December. January and Rebecca had wonderful plans and then Uncle Cyril came and changed <laughs> their plans and just to see how they both um, adapted their mm. hearts and they were intent we said to her she can postpone it and they both 
emphatically said no they're getting married and from 120 people it went down to 18 of us family members in our garden and Beautiful. we had the most magical magical wedding and we are just so grateful to God that he's answered our prayers in bringing a wonderful godly spouse for Rebecca yeah and um, the amazing thing was you know you start thinking about what is marriage and why they're doing it and all these people and now they want to should they, shouldn't they postpone it? But at the end of the day, it's between the two of them and the Lord. And um, that's the most important. So we are very blessed. And God is good. All and the we time. just encourage you to look up to God's goodness and faithfulness. Yeah. Miss you all. Love you. Bye. Bye. Hi. I'd just like to share um, my experience with the Sunday Hub. Um, we have um, our Sunday Hub with Brian and Estelle. They've opened up their home graciously. Um, we've had some really special times um, with ministry. Uh, the praise and worship has just been awesome. And uh, what I've really found is that uh, people um, are able to share um, in this space. They feel comfortable sharing in this space, so they um, also feel safe. So people asking for prayer requests. Um, so that has been very special. And I think what's also um, been a highlight for me is the fact that there's um, everybody participating as opposed to just having a lot of spectators. Um, so people really get the most out of the, the ministry. So yes, Sunday mornings um, is a highlight for me. And uh, the hub is something that I really look forward to on a Sunday morning. Hi, I'm Eugene. My name is Gareth and this is my beautiful wife Chantal. Um, we're just going to share a brief story of grace that we experienced throughout the year 2020. Um, early in the year, we um, connected with two little girls that we'd previously fostered uh, for three years and uh, managed to get hold of them and stay in contact and we heard that things weren't going so well and unfortunately them and their two little brothers uh, were going to be put into an orphanage so we decided to start a process to get them back and to have them come back and join us and live with us. Um, it was quite a long process and eventually by March they, um, we were able to go up to Secunda and I went and picked up the four little girls and as we got back we went into lockdown. Uh, so we started lockdown with nine children and it was uh, what seemed was going to be crazy but actually turned out to be such an amazing blessing. Yeah and when you think of the logistics of um, changing your family size so quickly and just the lockdown, I'm so grateful to the way God came to undergird the calling. I mean, he gave us this notion, this unction, and we just experienced such support and care and provision. And we, we were blown away because it, we, it was so unexpected. And even not being able to meet with one another and being isolated, we didn't realize how badly the family needed that to become one. And we needed no distractions and we needed nothing where others could like influence or speak into or cause us to, to want to like, find our solace somewhere else. We had to resolve interpersonal challenges and God just came to meet us in such an incredible way in, in both provision, encouragement, support and he has sustained us throughout this whole year in yeah, in an incredible way. Yeah, so what seemed to was going to be a really difficult year and, and was going to be very challenging uh, turned out to be the most amazing year of God's provision. Mm. We understand that there has been very difficult times for other people and um, we're just so thankful that God brought us into something and carried us so amazingly through. And we trust that he will do the same for many of you through 2021. God bless and keep well. Bye-bye. What amazing testimony. So good to hear all those stories. And, and it's so easy in the midst of all the doom and gloom of 2020 to lose sight of the goodness and the grace and the faithfulness of God. In fact, it's so easy to adopt the cynicism, cynicism of the world around us and, uh, and to inadvertently become these glass half full kind of people. And unless we actively and intentionally come and look deeper than what meets the eye, I fear that we're going to set ourselves up for a disheartening year ahead. In fact, it reminds me a little bit of when Kaz and I first met and and so I was a special kind of creature, I think. I, I had this long hair that went into these curly locks. I had these little John Lennon glasses. I had a dog that went everywhere with me. And, um, and one of my favorite things to wear was this technicolored uh, woolen waistcoat from India with these little wooden buttons. And, and, so, <laughs> and so I think it's safe to say that I wasn't any kind of eye candy. And there better not be any amens out there, especially from you, Kaz. But... But to commend Kaz, she had an ability to look beyond what met the eye, to see deeper. 
And, um, and if she didn't have that ability, we would not have ended up together today. Uh, and of course, she would have missed out on all of this. And so for those of you who don't know, my name is Steph and I want to just greet you and say welcome. It's great to be together. We are busy with a wonderful series called Annus Mirabilis. It's a Latin phrase which means wonderful year and that's what we want to fight for. We want to contend for a wonderful, amazing, astonishing year. And so if we simply look at the year ahead on a superficial level, if we look at it in terms of the money in our wallets or the course of corruption in the land or the availability of vaccines or, or, or maybe the state of our healthcare system and the healthcare workers out there or our inaccess to the beach and our inability to go and surf and I know that's hurting you Sid and I'm sorry about that. If this is what we're looking at and how we're looking at the world around us, we're, we're looking at it on a surface level or it meets the eye and we're going to be set up for disappointment. But if we're able to look beyond that, if we're able to look deeper, then I think there's a chance of us coming out on the other side rejoicing. And so last week we spoke about a checklist that we needed to help us launch successfully in the year and to into the year and to, and to give us the best possible chance of success. And on that checklist was number one, a source of hope. And we spoke into that two weeks ago. And then we shot ahead to number three last week and spoke about a source of reinforcement. And Today we're coming back to number two, a source of being. And when we talk about a source of being, we're talking about the source or the origin or where we derive our identity and our purpose and our mission and vision for life. And we're going to take the next three weeks to speak into that, starting today with knowing yourself, next week knowing your purpose, and the week after that knowing your Heavenly Father. But before we go any further, I just want to pause here and I want to ask us to come and pray and just open up uh, the rest of this message in prayer. So I want you, uh, if you feel comfortable, to bow your heads with me and to pray with me. Heavenly Father God, I want to come and thank you for this day. I want to thank you for this message and this opportunity and for this moment and for all of those who have come and place themselves before your word today. More than my voice, Lord God, I pray that people would hear your voice. And more than just a voice that would come and tickle their ears, Lord God, I pray that you would arrest all of us with your truth, that you would come and remind us of who we are, that you would come and shape us, not just to come and understand who we are, but to truly believe it and to live that out. I pray that you would help us and to, to guide this word into every heart listening out there today. I come and ask you to take this word and to use it in the lives of everyone listening. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, before we go any further, I want to ask you to press pause on this. And I want to ask you to go and grab a mirror, any mirror that you can, and to come back with it as soon as you can and to get going again. So go do that now. Great. So we're talking about knowing yourself. We're talking about knowing who you are. We're talking about your identity. And so in the context of that, won't you take that mirror? And this might be a little bit awkward for some of you, but come and give it a go. And so take that mirror and place it in front of you. And I want you to look at your reflection. Just start looking at it. Don't look at the screen. Look at your reflection. I want to ask you, what do you see and do you like what you see do you like all of what you see or just some of it or nothing at all and as you look there is there anything you would change okay let's go a little deeper still looking in the mirror do you like the person in the mirror do you truly know the person you're looking at in the mirror do you know who you are and so when we come and look in the mirror and I know this is true of me I haven't really stared at myself in the mirror but once upon a time I did that and I was like oh goodness I, I never really and maybe there's some of you out there that can't help but stare at yourself in the mirror but but as I've taken you through this process what 
What was going on in your mind? What was going on in your heart? Were you looking there and thinking there's some things that you'd like to change? Were you looking and saying, oh, I've got a big bulbous nose, I want to get rid of that thing? Or were you looking there and, and, and just thinking maybe of your ears and say, oh, I've got satellite dishes for ears, I want to get rid of those things. Or I've got hair like Frau Fabisner and I just wish it was different. Or, or was it, I've got these big, thick glasses, they're like the bottoms of of two glass two liter coke bottles or or did you did you think of your legs and say oh, I've got legs like chicken sticks they're just the worst or or was it I've got this big tummy it's like a Sunday afternoon weaver it's just getting out of control and so the world shapes you by sowing insecurity I don't know if you know that but if you if you just the world says if you just come and wear this deodorant then chicks will dig you if you just Come and put this lotion on your legs, you'll have sexy legs. If you just come and wear this brand, you'll be popular. If you just come and use this cream, then you'll hide your wrinkles. If you just come and drive this car, then uh, then people will begin to respect you. And it can be a little bit more subtle than that, how the world comes and sows insecurity in our lives. If you if you want to be a good father or if you want to be a good mother, then, then you want to get this kind of job and you want to get that kind of home loan to afford this kind of house or... Or, or if you want a picture-perfect family, you need to be able to come and to get this kind of car to go to these kinds of places. And, and it's reinforced in a subtle way and a not-so-subtle way, whether it's advertising media or through social media. The world generally comes and shapes us by picking up on our perceived faults or shortcomings or deficits, and it begins to prod it and probe it. And so whether it's how you look or whether it's what you have or whether, you, or whether it's who you hang out with, the world and the marketing machine behind it is so proficient in unsettling us, making us doubt who we are, coming and calling us to question ourselves and just generally sowing insecurity. But God is different. It's so different with God. You see, the world shapes you by sowing insecurity, but God secures you no matter what shape you're in. And so for the course of 2021, if we come and we take our cue from the world around us, and we come and find our identity and we listen to who the world is telling we are, telling us who we are, we're setting ourselves up for a bad year, for an anus horrible, it's a horrible year. But if we come and we take our cue from God on who we are, I believe we're setting ourselves up and we're well on the way for a good year, a wonderful year. And so in light of this identity that God wants to come and shape within us and remind us and reinforce in our lives, I want to tell you a story of a little boy, a little boy in his boat. I've told it a few times before, but it's, a, it's worth retelling. And it's the story of this little boy who, who uh, had it in his mind to come and make a boat. And he got a, a piece of wood and he whittled out this boat. He put a mast on it and he put a, a sail on it. And he used to love to go down to the lake and go play with the boat down there. And uh, after some time, uh, he was playing with this boat when a gust of wind came in and took this boat and took it away from him. And he was devastated. He was gutted. Uh, and some months later, he was walking around town and he saw in the shop window a boat that looked just like his. And he, he went in intrigued and he picked it up and looked and he saw his name at the bottom of the boat. And, uh, and he marveled. He went to the shopkeeper and said, this is my boat. I lost it. There's my name there. And the shopkeeper with a stern face looked at him and said, Losers, weepers, finders, keepers. If you want the boat, you must come and you need to buy it. And so, and so the boy went away and some months later he came back and he bought this boat with all the money he'd saved. And as he walked out of the shop, he took that boat as if it was a living, precious creature and held it to his chest. And he whispered down to this little boat and he said, I made you, I lost you, but today I got you back. And so... This story, the story is a, is a little parable, of course, that, that in it we come and we see and understand that the, the little boy in the story is a picture of Jesus. And the boat in the story is a picture of us. And the story and this parable is helpful because it comes and it reminds us about identity, about your identity, that God made you, that God lost you, and that God saves you. And so the little boy 
and the boat is a compelling story and as a parable it comes and touches our hearts but scripture tells exactly the story in fact we see a version of it in a very succinct form in three verses in Hebrews chapter 1 where it says long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days he's spoken to us by his son who's his son Jesus whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the power of by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so this passage of scripture is so incredibly rich. If we, if we just took this passage in a year, we couldn't exhaust the richness of it. But, but I want to come and pick up on aspects of, this, of these three verses that come and reinforce the story of the little boy in the boat. And so we see it firstly, number one, that God made you. Hebrews 1 verse 2 says, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world Jesus created God created the world everything created is made by God you were made by God secondly God lost you Hebrews 1 verse 3 says after making purification for sins it's sin that draws us away from God and so God didn't lose us like you lose a set of keys he lost us like a father loses a son who runs away from home and so it's sin that comes and does this Thirdly, God saves you after making purification for sins, after making purification to come and to purify, to take away these sins. Who did this? Jesus did this. And so, and so with this framework in mind, I want to come and I want to talk into number one, that God made you. And so you're not the product of a depersonalized, stochastic, evolutionary process. You're not the product of a big night between your mom and dad 25 years ago. You're not the product of the ovarian lottery. You're the precious product of God. And so before your mother and father ever met, before your mother and father's genetic material combined together, before your mother and father were ever your mother and father, you had a heavenly father. And so speaking to the prophet Jeremiah, God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. He speaks this of Jeremiah. It speaks of his pattern of who he is. And it speaks of who he is and the pattern that we find ourselves in. That just as he knew Jeremiah, so too he knew us before we were born, before we were even conceived. In Psalm 139, King David declares, your eyes saw my unformed substance, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. And so again, we see something of the pattern of God here, yeah, that he knew the days of David and the allotted days of David before there was even yet one. And if it's true of David, it's true of us too. And so not, that, not only did God know us before we were conceived, but he also allotted our days. More than that, we read of the origin of mankind, of where we come from in Genesis chapter 2, right? Verse 7 says, The Lord formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And so this is true of mankind, of humanity, that God comes and makes us. Not only did he know us, not only did he know our days and allot them, but he also comes and he makes us. Going further than that into Genesis chapter 2, on the same point, I guess, it says there in verse 21, So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of the ribs, closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her, into, uh, and brought her to the man. And so here we see that it's not just man, but man and woman that God comes and creates. And I think sometimes women look at this passage of scripture as almost um, uh, dismissive of women that they're from the man but actually if you come and you understand it it's incredibly liberating and I want to just for a minute or two take a massive sidebar and we'll come back to this identity that we have in God and I want to talk into gender equality if I may just for a moment and it's important to take this gap because it's something we have to fight for 
And so here we see that, that the woman is taken out of the man, a, a rib, and God is trying to communicate something to us. And so let me put it like this, that when we come and we read the famous scripture, John three sixteen, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Begotten means to be of. And so, and so if I have children, those children are begotten of me. They are flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. And so Jesus Christ was begotten of God. He is the same substance and essence as God the Father is. And so, and so I've used this illustration many times before. If you had a lump of clay and that represented God and you took from that lump another lump, those two lumps would be exactly the same substance. It's, a, it's how it is with God the Father and God the Son. You see, Jesus is as much God as God is God. And this is so fundamentally important because it, it communicates a value. It communicates something about the Godhead. That within the Godhead of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, there is this thing of co-equality. They are co-equal. They are the same. They are exactly the same. And we can understand that from the fact that the substance and the essence of Jesus is the same substance and the essence of God, if I could put it in that way. And so when God comes and takes from the man a rib to make Eve, he's communicating to us that they are of the same substance. That, they, that if you had to take them to a lab and to test them and to test uh, their substance, their essence, their being, they are exactly the same. And just as God comes and communicates value based on that substance to the Godhead, where he says they are co-equal, so too God comes and he communicates our value to us as men and women in the same way, saying based on your substance, you guys are co-equal. You are equal. There is equality here. But what the world does is it comes and it shifts function above this substance or this intrinsic value that we have by virtue of God creating us and it measures value based on function but God never does that that is why when Jesus comes and he's baptized coming out of the water before he's done anything before he started his ministry God can come to him and say this is my son with whom I am well pleased why is he pleased with him because of the in inherent intrinsic essence and substance of who Jesus is it's a picture of God's unconditional love and it's the same for us God measures as the highest point as the pinnacle point of our value the fact that he made us and of our substance and by virtue of that we're all the same we need to fight for this not just in our heads but in reality and so that's a massive sidebar and I want to call us to and remind us to, I want to bring us back again, if I can, quickly to this fact that God knew us, that he comes and he allotted our days, but he also made us. But more than that, David declares in Psalm 139, For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately, intri intricately woven in the depths of the earth. And so again, we see something of God's pattern here. That not only did he come and make us, but he made us well. That we are fearfully and wonderfully made. But just as I quoted around Jesus and his baptism, we see in Matthew 3, God saying, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. That God comes and communicates la love and affirms that not based on what we do, but on who we are, on our substance, which he comes and gives to us. And so not only has he made us well, but he loves us unconditionally in the way that there's nothing we can do that can rob ourselves of his love. But more than that, we see in Isaiah 43, God declaring over his people, he says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes. And so not only, not only are you wonderfully made, not only are you um, are loved unconditionally, but you are also precious, incredibly precious to God. And so with this in mind, <clears throat> excuse me, with this in mind, we can come and we can say before you were born, God knew you. He allotted each and every day <clears throat> to your life. And he, just, he didn't just 
come and allot your days. He came and he made you and he didn't just make you. He made you well. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and he didn't just make you well. He loves you unconditionally. And not only does he love you unconditionally, but you are incredibly precious to him. M maybe some of you needed to hear that today. And, and so as you look in the mirror there, there are a whole bunch of lies that are robbing you of the truth of God that you might have just heard now. And so there's no Made in China sticker on the bottom of your foot. There's no factory reject label on your life. No, you have been made by God and God does not make rubbish. You are beautiful. And so I want everyone to say where you are at home now, I want you to say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now say, I am beautiful. Good. Now turn to the person next to you and say, you are beautiful. Excellent. And so that brings us to the end of this first point, that God made us. The second point is that God lost you. And so what does it mean that God lost us? And like I said, not like you lose a set of keys, but how a son would run away from a father. God lost us. And so in the story, the, the wind is a picture of sin and the shopkeeper is a picture of the devil. And as we come and we read Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, it says, After making purification for sins, it's the sin that draws us away from God. It's the sin of the world that causes us to run away from our Heavenly Father. And so we need to understand that there is not a single person who is exempt from sin. Romans 3 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we are all sinners. We are all inherently selfish. We're all self-promoting, self-protecting and self-preserving. And so while sin might be selfish to the core, the one who is affected by sin or the ones affected by sin is not simply ourselves. It's those around us and others. D.A. Carson says, what makes sin so sinful, awful and condemning and damnably heinous is not all its social ramifications. It is that sin is first and foremost sin against an almighty and holy God. And so just as it's the wind that comes and takes the boat away from the little boy, it's sin that comes and draws us away from God. And so David puts it like this. He says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before, you, before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so he says here against you and you only have our sin. But, but, but even though David is here confessing his infidelity with, with Bathsheba and his dishonoring of her and her family, he comes and he says against you and you alone, God, I've sinned. And the reason why he says this and the reason why he can say this is that he understands that sin, that every sin starts out first and foremost with a sin against God. And, and David understands and we need to understand that, that if we are able to come and stop ourselves from sinning against God, we'll be able to stop our sin against other people and any other kind of sin. Because sin starts first and foremost with the wrong against God. But the problem of sin is not simply a surface level issue. It's not a, a case of mind over matter. You see, J.R. Packer says the assertion of original sin makes the point that we're not sinners because we sin, but rather we sin because we are sinners, born with a nature enslaved to sin. And so if we understand sin, if we understand sin, then we begin to understand that sin is not a matter of what we do, but of who we are. And it's for this reason that David can come and say with such clarity and conviction Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And so we see in the context of our identity that God made us. And in the context of God making us, it's like he came and he made you and he made you well, like, like a glass of water, perfectly clear, perfectly crystal clear that you can see through. But we also see that God lost you. And he lost us to sin. It's like taking a drop of ink and pouring it into that glass of water and it becomes murky and dirty. But he also comes 
and saves us. God saves you. And so, and so when God comes and saves us, what does it mean? It's, it's like taking that glass of water, that murky, inky water, and taking a magic drop of something and pouring it in, and it magically comes clear, and it decontaminates, it purifies that water. This is what it means for God to come and save us. He comes and purifies us from our sins, and this is what Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says so clearly. It says, after making purification for sins and so maybe the question we should ask is what is it or more specifically who is it that comes and purifies us from our sins 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 says God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men the man Jesus Christ who gave himself as a ransom for all. And so it says there that there is one mediator, not several mediators, namely Muhammad and Krishna and Buddha and humanism and philanthropy. No, there is only one. And just in case you're not sure, Jesus reminds us in John 14, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one, absolutely no one comes to the Father except through me. And the reason it can only be Jesus is by virtue of the nature of the ransom that he comes and pays. You see, only he could come and pay the ransom. And so in the New Living Translation, Leviticus 17 says this, For the life of the body is in its blood, and I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you. Purify you from what? From your sins, making you right with God so that you can go back to God. It is the blood given in exchange for your life that makes purification possible. And so it was no one else, not Muhammad, not Krishna, not Buddha, not your mom and dad, not your Uncle Bob, not your dog Rover that was willing to come and to sacrifice themselves and to give the gift of blood to redeem you or purify you. And, and, and even if they did, even if they did, it wouldn't work because their blood too is contaminated. It too needs purification and that's why Jesus is the only one that can. And so Hebrews chapter 9 comes and tells us this. It says, Jesus entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats or calves or of your uncle Bob, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And so it's not the blood of your uncle Bob, but it's the blood of Jesus Christ who, as we mentioned earlier, is as much God as God is God. It's the blood of God himself being poured out there. And so his blood is not contaminated with sin. It's absolutely pure. And so I think in light of this, it would be safe to come and say that you are loved. You are deeply loved, so much so that God gave his life for you. And we read that exactly here in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, for God so loved you, that he came and gave his only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so with that in mind, I want to remind you that God made you. God lost you, but God comes and saves you. And so for most of you, I know you're sitting there and saying, man, uh, you're not telling me anything new. And I've heard these stories a hundred times before, and I've heard these verses a thousand times before. But the reason I'm telling you this is that it's human nature to leak we are, as people, as mankind, as human beings, we are like a leaky, blow-up camping mattress that just leaks throughout the night and you've got to keep on pumping it up. And we leak. We leak the truth of God. And I'm telling us this. I'm telling us these things now, reminding you of these things because I want to do that. I want to remind you and I want to come and reinforce the truth in your life. You see, it's one thing to know the truth, but it's another thing to believe it. And so you see, our behavior, our actions, what we do is not a derivative of what we say as much as it's a result of what we believe. And so we can say that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, but do you really truly believe that? You can say that, that I'm loved by God, but do you truly believe that? You can say that God is my provider, but do you truly believe that? You can come and say that, that God has a calling for me and he has a purpose for me. But do you truly, really believe that? You can come and say that Jesus died on the cross for you. But do you truly, really believe that? Are we just saying it? 
Are we just paying lip service to God and saying the right thing? Or do we truly believe it in our heart of hearts? And so in order for us to have an Annus Mirabilis, a wonderful year, a year that despite incredible hardships that there may potentially be in the year of, ahead for us, that, that despite these things can still be wonderful, we need to be able to come and take the truth of God in our lives and upgrade it from something we simply know or speak to something we truly actually really believe. And one of the ways that we do this is by reinforcing, by reminding, by renewing our minds. And so in the middle of last year, I was in a pretty dark place, I guess. And it was a time where I was so volatile. My moods were up and down and I was insecure. And there came a point where I was like, enough is enough, man. I'm so unpredictable and all over the place. I need to sort this out. And, and I, I began to go for these walks in the forest and... And these walks began to culminate in me reminding myself of my identity. And it culminated in, in me writing something down. It's almost like a letter from God. It's God speaking to me. And it actually is exactly that. Because everything in it is actually referenced back to Scripture. A truth that, that God has either generally or specifically spoken to me. That, that, that I'm coming and reminding myself of. And so... And so as the weeks go by, I come and I pick this up and I read it again and again. And so, and so here it is over here. I'm going to read it to you and I'm going to share what I, I, I read. And, and in many ways, it's just a reminder of, of just what I've preached. And so it says here, I knew you. It's like God speaking to me. I knew you before you were born. I put your inward parts in their place. And I knitted you together in your mother's womb. I have allotted the times and the places where you shall dwell. I have numbered your days and called you by name. You are the product of my workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Behold, I am with you now and always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will guide you by night and by day. Leave your nation, your kindred and your father's house and go to the land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation. Is a nation built in a day? Question mark. Consecrate yourself now, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And so on a weekly basis, I'm going back to this and I'm reading it and I'm reminding myself of it. I need to be reminded of it because there are lies that come in from the world around me that come and sow insecurity. But God comes and secures us regardless of whatever shape we're in. And he showed that to me last year and he does that again and again. And so whether the lie is that you are not loved, whether it's that you're ugly or you have no purpose, that your life has run its course, that you're good for nothing, that you're a loser, whatever it might be, I want you to know that those are lies. And I want to call you to come and reinforce your identity with the truth of God. And so as I finish now, we're going to have a whole bunch of scripture references scroll up through the screen and as they scroll up over the screen, I want you to sit there and to, to either read them out loud or read them in your heart. And as you do that, to allow God to come and get rid of the lies in your life and to reinforce the truth of who you are. If you are a believer, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, for Him to come and remind you of who you are. If you're not a believer, I want you to know that Jesus loves you, that, that He wants to come. And he wants to grab you in his embrace and say, you, I made you, I lost you, but today I've won you back. And you can do that by simply crying out and praying to him and connecting with us and we'll help you from there. But more than that, right now, won't you watch the screen, won't you read out these things and allow God to come and reinforce who you are. God bless you.